<coughs> the Bible, New Testament, uh, in fact, uh, it offered to you quite freely here this afternoon in Stafford once again. Word of God that uh, is pure, and of course we are assured it is kept pure in all ages, pure than uh, silver tried in a furnace seven times. That means, uh, to you, that means uh, completely and utterly as pure as pure can be. That's uh, the only thing that is pure. In Stafford today, certainly not you and I, and of course the reason why. Well, of course, we need God's Word, God's salvation, God's Son, Jesus Christ, that through Him that our hearts and minds might be purified. That is by his precious blood. The Bible, the Word of God, of course, is the record, the testimony uh, concerning God's Son, Jesus Christ. How that a person might be saved from their sin and reconciled to God. Good afternoon, sir. How are you doing? We do that. Hey, pardon, we sir? do that every week. We do that every week. All right, okay. Yeah. Please, Sundays. Okay. Whatever that means. So, the Word of God, friends, offered to you quite freely, as I see. It's yours for the taking, uh, freely offered. Uh, uh, do with as you will. But it is, as I say, the Word of God. It's not mine. Free to give. And, of course, yours freely to receive. In order for a person to have, um, I don't know what yours would be, you know, that gives you comfort in life and death. You know, when you think about, uh, well, you know, all that life has to throw at you. If you've been alive for more than five minutes, I'm sure that uh, uh, you'll understand when I see that uh, it throws at us uh, many, many difficulties, and of course, well, that's uh, rather putting it mildly. Some people, of course, they say, well, the chief end of man, uh, the primary purpose of man is just simply to be happy. Well, uh, if that's the case, we're not doing a very good job because there's not many happy people around in the world. And then some people, they say that, uh, well, all we need to do is love. Uh, they don't define the love, but uh, again, if that's the chief end of man, then we're not doing very well because we're still killing and slaughtering one another in a whole host of different ways. So it would seem to me that there's a better, higher purpose than that. Uh, you know, a place where we can find comfort in the midst of life with all the horrors that it holds for us and then of course that's not the end of it you know you know as if that were not enough all the afflictions all the difficulties all the torments that life holds for us and then we're faced with the uh, ignominy of death then comes well you see the end but then of course well the bible says the problem is that's not the end. It is a point that the man wants to die. After that, then comes more, then comes worse. Then you might say, well, if you're not reconciled to God, that is, through his son, Jesus Christ, then comes the worst nightmare that you could ever have imagined. So what for you, I ask, would bring to you comfort in the life in life and death. Well, for me, for we as Christians, uh, I might say our comfort is that, well, we belong to Jesus. Uh, he has made satisfaction for our sins, that has died for them, uh, cleared us before God, and he assures us of eternal life. My sheep hear my voice, says Jesus, and I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish so you see uh, 
That's our comfort, and that's what we've come to share with you this afternoon, how that you too could possibly, possibly enjoy that same comfort in life and death, no matter how bad it might be, no matter the afflictions, and no matter, of course, how soon or how late that death comes upon you. But you can be assured that's the one thing that you can guarantee in this life, and uh, there is no other, but you can guarantee one day you're going to cock your toes up and go out of this world. You'll go out feet first one morning. You'll put your socks on, but it will be the undertaker who'll take them off at night, not you. So I would have you simply to understand where comfort can be found in both life and death. How that you too can belong to Jesus, how that you too can be assured of eternal life, and how, of course, uh, well, Jesus can make satisfaction for your sins. Because this, you see, is what he came for. This is what he came into the world for. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. That was his chief and certain purpose, to rescue us from a certain and known danger, uh, to rescue uh, men and women such as you and I from our sins. That, of course, well, that's where, that's the key, that's where you see the misery, that's the pit, that's the source out of which all the misery comes from. You know the saying, you've heard it many times, I'm sure. Maybe perhaps you've even used it yourself, you know, in reference to somebody else. She's as miserable as sin, you see. Ah, he's as miserable as sin. Because don't we know that's where all the misery springs from. That's where it comes from, out of that pit of sin. It's the beast in us. It's that nature in us. Conceived, says the Bible, conceived and born in sin, and therefore children of wrath on the wrong side of God right from day one, even from before that. That's where, you see, human life begins at the moment of conception. That's where life begins, and that's where your sinful career begins conceived in sin, and so therefore born in sin, and so therefore on the wrong side, the dark side of God, therefore a child of wrath, not a child of God. And of course it's in becoming a child of God uh, that one receives this comfort you see in life and death, this comfort that God alone through his son Jesus Christ can bring to you, can give to you. The Son of God, you see, made of a woman, made under the law, paid the penalty of the law, and died, that is, for transgressors, for sinners, in order that, well, that they might receive eternal life and know that whatever life throws at them, and however death comes to them, however soon or however late, that they might know that they have eternal life through the Son of God. But of course, we have to understand, do we not, that, uh, you know, that that's not the way, that's not the way that it should have been. The Bible says, Lo, this only have I found, that God hath made man upright, but they have sought out many inventions. You see, the problem, uh, the problem is, uh, is with us, not with God, you know? And some people, well, they would blame other people. That's the language of Adam, you know? It was that woman that you gave me, God. So therefore, not only was it the woman's fault, but it was God's fault too. This is the way of the sinner, always blaming somebody else, you know? Blame shifting, you know, it's the nature of the sinner. Not my fault, somebody else's fault, or ultimately God's fault. But sin, I can assure you, 
from the Word of God, from the Bible, not God's fault at all, but man's fault, man's responsibility. God made man upright, but man sought out many inventions, inventing all kinds of excuses, inventing, you know, well, all kinds of means for avoiding, you know, not believing, not trusting in God through His Son, Jesus Christ. Inventing ways back to God, you know, of His own devising. Religions abound, 9,900 of them in your world today, up to date, according, that is anyway, to the Oxford University Press. 9,900 religions invented by men. You see what I mean? Rather than take God's course, rather than take God's Son, rather than receive God's love, rather than receive God's recon reconciliation, rather than receive the forgiveness of God, man would rather invent many, many other ways of his own devising. Well, friends, God made man upright, but man has sought out many inventions, from Rome to Mecca and everything else in between, every cult and sect they can possibly think of, including the religion of evolution. Thinking, of course, that that will give you some kind of defense against the Almighty in that day when he judges all men and of course, well, you know just the same as everybody else that you are accountable, that there is a day of accountability. That day will certainly come. And it will be no good on that day blaming God or blaming anybody else. Because on that day, you see, God will reveal everything shall be laid bare in that day when God judges you. All the motives, all the intentions of your heart, everything, the books will be open and everything will be laid bare. There'll be no excuses. There'll be no blame shifting. And there will certainly be no blaming God because God will show us quite clearly that man's, it was man's responsibility, sin, we are all of us, accountable and of course we're faced with all this misery in life and death because of sin that's where it comes from out of the same source the same pit everybody else all the pain all the suffering all the sickness all the death it comes out of the same source it comes from human sin God did not make man that way. God made man upright, but man sought out many inventions all by himself. Man's responsibility, not God's, not at all. We are responsible for sin. Your first parent and mine, his name was Adam. And Adam brought sin and death into the world with his disobedience, his rebellion against God and began to get children in his own sinful likeness and passed on to his posterity, that is to you and I, passed on the sinful disease. It's what the Bible calls terms original sin. The original sin was with Adam, passed on to the generations all the way down the line, right to the very end, even to this time, so that you get children in your own sinful likeness just as I do, just as we all do. And so God can say, you see that there is not a man, a woman that sinneth not. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All. And that wickedness, young man, yeah, you'll give account for that too on that day. So repent and believe the gospel, young man, while well, you may. So as I was saying, you know, it's not God's uh, fault, it's not God's blame, it's man. We are responsible for that original sin, 
just as though way back in the beginning you yourself personally reached out and took that forbidden fruit yourself and brought that sin into the world. Accountable to God, every single one of us, for that original sin and, of course, for our own personal involvement in sin. But it's from that original sin, don't you know? That's the fountain from which comes all your misery, your pain, suffering, sickness, depression, and then, of course, ultimately death. But then, of course, not ultimately, because that's not the end. After that, then comes the judgment. So does God do us an injustice is our following question in requiring of us that which we cannot perform. Because here's the problem. We cannot get out of the mess of sin. We cannot find comfort in life and death, not without God's remedy, not without God's Son, Jesus Christ. He was sent into the world, came into the world, and performed that for us, which we could not do ourselves. For no matter how hard we try, we cannot attain to the goodness. We cannot attain to the standard that God requires of us. Perfect obedience uh, to his law, perfect obedience, that is, to his commandments. His law summed up in those what we call the Ten Commandments. We're lawbreakers, every one of us. We can't help ourselves. We are impotent. We are powerless. Because we are born, conceived and born in sin, we have sinful natures. cannot help yourself. You cannot but sin of every hour of every day given to you. Millions upon millions upon millions of sins that you will have to give account for in that day. Utterly powerless to a man, to a woman, every single one. So is God unjust then? If I cannot help myself, you say, if I'm a sinner by nature, and if I must needs sin, if I must needs break God's commands, day after day in thought and word and deed? Is God not unjust then in requiring of me that which I cannot by any means perform? Well, the answer to that question is no. Because God is both merciful, yes, but he is also just. No. You see, you see it at the instigation of the devil, a willful and a, a willful disobedience that's what has deprived us and our posterity of the power of the ability to walk with God in righteousness man made up right by God in the beginning you see with the power to obey God with the ability to walk with God in a perfect righteousness and true holiness. But as a result, you see the instigation of the devil, man listening to the voice of the devil, which he still does today, rather than listening to the voice of God. At the instigation of the devil, a willful obedience, man is a sinner, you see, by nature and by choice. By choice, you see. And so, dear friends, God is by no means unjust in requiring of you and I, all of us, that which he requires, that true knowledge of himself, a perfect righteousness. But you see, well, where? Where on earth is such to be found? Well, not in, on earth, but in heaven, at the right side, at the right hand of God. That's where the true knowledge and righteousness of God is to be found now in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who sits there at the right hand of God's power, who came into the world, was crucified, dead, buried, and raised again, 
and ascend it to the throne of God. There, there you will find the true knowledge of God in Christ Jesus. There you will find the perfect righteousness that God requires of you through faith in his name. But without, you have no comfort at all in life. You have no comfort in all the afflictions and all the misery that life heaps upon you. All the unhappiness, all the depression, all the, the evil, the wickedness, friends, that is cast upon you in this life as you travel through this sin-cursed world. No comfort, none whatsoever, without Jesus, without the Son of God. The righteousness of God, you see, has been revealed, revealed to us in the gospel, the good news concerning God's Son, Jesus Christ. Here's the thing, in that day when God judges you in righteousness, perfect righteousness, God will require of you that you're trusting in the righteousness of another, not your own. Because you stand before God in that day trusting in your righteousness, your perceived righteousness, what you think to be righteous. Oh, friends, you are going to be sadly sadly disappointed because your righteousness as God says are like filthy rags in his sight the best of your deeds they are like tattered rags filthy rags says God untouchable by God now and in that day too so now dear friends you need to be found trusting in the righteousness of another you need to come to God through his son Jesus Christ with that attitude of humility. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and say, I come, nothing in my hand I bring, simply to his cross, the cross of Jesus, that is, I cling. Because in the gospel you see the death and resurrection of God's son. That's where you find that's where you find the righteousness of God revealed in the gospel. In the name of Jesus, God's own Son. Doesn't your voice get a bit? No, you on. couldn't show it. Am I? Okay. Well, that's nice. You're a Christian? I don't know what I am, mate. No, no. Have you ever read the Bible? Huh? Well, maybe you could. Then you could repent and believe the gospel and you would be saved. You would be a Christian then. Trusting, you see, in the righteousness that God has revealed. God has revealed the righteousness. So he's not unjust at all. He's not unjust in requiring of us that which we cannot perform. Because God has made it available to us the means by which we can be saved from the afflictions. From all the consequences of sin all its misery in this life and then the facing of death and perishing for all eternity god has provided you with a means by which you can be saved you can be brought back to the image of god to a true knowledge of god and a perfect righteousness this is what god requires of you and god has provided the means by which you can not attain to such, not achieve such, but receive such. Because salvation can never be achieved by you, attained by you. It is simply and only received. He came, Jesus, that is, to his own, but his own received him not, but to as many as received him to them, that is, who believed in his name, he gave the power to become children of God. So God is not unjust at all. The fault, the blame lies with us because of the instigation of the devil, a willful disobedience, sinners by nature and sinners by choice is what we are, all of us. We and our posterity, but God has made known the power. God has 
made known the means by which we can be repaired, restored to God, and to the favor of God through his dear Son, his only begotten, our Lord Jesus Christ, whom we declare to you today. So the question that follows that is, will God suffer the disobedience and the rebellion of men to go unpunished? Of course not, no. Bible reveals that God does not wink at sin the way that you and I might do, brush it under the carpet, account it as being a small thing of no consequence, well, you see, it was just a little white lie. That little white lie is enough to damn you, any person, for all eternity. God is terribly displeased with our original sin, Adam's sin, uh, for which, of course, he holds you and I accountable, and our actual sins. God is terribly displeased that almost, uh, that almost sounds uh, uh, quite light, really, in, uh, in light of the reality. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven, the Bible says. The holy displeasure of God, the burning, smoking wrath of God is upon men and women because of their holding the truth of God, the knowledge of God, that is, in unrighteousness, in wickedness, that is. So your sin go unpunished? No, it is already being punished because the wrath of God is all over you. Not just your own nation, but the world at large, unbelieving, the wrath of God is upon sinful humanity outside of Jesus Christ. So your sin will not go unpunished, terribly displeased by the original sin, Adam's sin, and our actual sin. And his judgment, of course, is both temporal in this world. You see, the Bible tells us that there are consequences now in this world for our sin and unbelief. That's why many people in your society today are already broken in body, broken in mind some, lies, lie in ruins as a result of their sinful practice, their sinful living. It's the punishment of God, you see. There are no such things, friends, as accidents. You know, when we read of some horrific, some horrific uh, crime, you know, and human life is taken, whether by war, by famine, you know, or by what you count to be accidents, there are no accidents. People's lives are taken in the judgment and the wrath of God as a result of sin. It's the punishment. It's what's due to us. We got no complaint. And when you see such things happening, terrible disasters, shootings, you know, men and women killed, or tragedies that take human life, the question that ought to be in your mind is, well, where would you be with God if you were involved in that? Because as Jesus says, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. So sin is most certainly punished now in this world, in this life. And maybe, who knows, perhaps some of the things that are falling out to you at this present time, maybe that's what you ought to be thinking, is where does this come from? Hear ye the rod, and who had the point in it? That is the question that perhaps ought to be in your mind. My circumstances, the misery that I'm faced with in my life presently, where is this coming from? Perhaps maybe it's the Almighty tapping you on the shoulder, wanting to awaken you to the reality of God, 
the reality of your sin and the reality, of course, of the world to come and your need of salvation, righteousness, deliverance from the wrath of God. Because I tell you, friends, there is but one thing that answers that the wrath of God answers to. And that's the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. That alone can take away his displeasure from off any man, woman, or child born into this world. But do remember, we, all of us, we and our children, conceived and born in sin, and therefore children of wrath, quite naturally. But then, of course, that punishment, that wrath of God will turn, will turn from temporal, will turn to, to eternal, unless, uh, unless the curse is removed, unless the punishment is removed, unless forgiveness is granted, unless pardon is given, unless you're cleared in the court of heaven, unless God forgives your sins in Jesus' name. Friends, there's only one way that a man or woman can be reconciled to God, that that wrath, that that curse for sin, that that punishment can be removed. And God has provided the means. God's sending his son into the world. The Lamb of God he's called in the New Testament which taketh away the sin of the world and would take away yours. And taking away your sin, take away the wrath of God. Nothing else will take it away. It remains upon you, hangs over you like the sword of Damocles, waiting to fall upon you at any given moment, lest you repent and believe the gospel. But the means is provided for you. Lamb of God was slain from before the foundation of the world. God, in his loving kindness, provided such, planned for such, before even man sinned against him. And today, still, yet men and women are being reconciled to God. The world over, men and women are finding salvation in Christ Jesus. Not religion, but salvation. Forgiveness, not religion. Reconciliation to God, rightness with God, safety, comfort, and life and death. Real comfort and life and death, knowing that they belong to Jesus, that they're not their own. Knowing that their sins, the satisfaction has been made for their sins. And knowing eternal life through Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who came into the world for that reason and for that purpose. Do you know that comfort? Do you have that comfort in life and death? Oh, you might ask, the question begs itself, is God not merciful? Yes, he is. But he's also just too. He's also just, absolutely just. He'll not punish one innocent person. No innocent person will ever go to hell. But friends, there is no such thing as an innocent person. Conceived and born and sin, all of us, every man, woman, and child born into this world, except for one, that is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So you see, God is just, God is perfectly just, but he is merciful too. Oh, he is very merciful. For why he bid you, seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return to the Lord and he will show mercy and abundantly pardon. Yes, there is mercy with God. This is the heart of the gospel, that there is forgiveness with God, that there is a way back to God, that there is a way out of the misery of life and death, that there is a way by which a man can be assured of eternal life, sins can be satisfied for. There's a way by which a man or woman can have comfort in life and death, 
But if you reject God, if you reject the salvation, if you reject the medicine, well, whose blame is it? You go to the doctor, and the doctor tells you you've got terminal disease, and he puts the medicine on the table, and you walk out of his surgery and leave the medicine sitting on the table. Well, who are you going to blame when you die? You're going to blame the doctor? You're going to blame the medicine, the chemist? Who are you going to blame? Nobody's fault but yours. You would not take the medicine. Well, God has provided the medicine. His son, the blood of his son, Jesus Christ, shed on the cross that you might be healed, that you might be made well, that you might be made, brought back to God, that you might be given comfort in life and death and the assurance of eternal life. My sheep hear my voice. Maybe you don't hear the voice of the shepherd because you're not one of his. I don't know. Only you can answer that question, but my sheep hear my voice, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Never. Do you have that comfort? Do you have that assurance? Are you trusting in Jesus? Because that's the only way you can have it. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, is God's command with the promise. The assurance for everyone who believes is eternal life, is the forgiveness of their sins, is reconciliation to God. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, but it's believers. It's only believers that are saved. It's only believers that are reconciled to God. Unbelievers are not. Unbelievers remain under the wrath of God, the displeasure of God. God has provided you with the means, but will you, will you make use of the means? God requires, God is merciful, but he requires that sin be punished. And God punished sin as his own son. That's what the cross was all about. Jesus prior to the cross would have had the cup pass from him. So horrific, so horrible was the thought of it. The wrath of God, of the Almighty for the sins of the world coming upon him. Let this cup pass from me, he said. But there was no other way by which man could be reconciled to God but through the death of his son. So that sin was punished, punished severely in his son. On that cross, hell fell upon him, the hell that was due to the sinners of this world. But if Jesus did not take your sin, if Jesus did not take your wrath, if Jesus did not take your hell upon himself on that cross, you will bear it yourself. Every iota, every last ounce of it, you will bear yourself. In that day when God judges the human race as he will and as he must do. So yes, God is merciful, but sin had to be punished and punished with everlasting punishment in both body and soul. That's why Jesus came into the world. That's why he was conceived of the Holy Spirit. He did not have an earthly father because the sin nature is passed on through the loins of the male, the father. He was without sin. That qualified him to be the sin bearer, to go to the cross, to die for sinners, to take that punishment upon himself that it might not be yours or mine. He bore the wrath of God. He bore the eternal punishment of God upon himself in both body and soul. The darkness that fell upon him 
the darkness that was due to you and to I. Hell, friend, hell descended upon the lovely, beautiful Son of God. Jesus so loved the world that he gave himself up to that death, to that hell, that it might not be yours. Please do not be saying to me, my life is hell. No, it's not. It's not. I hear foolish, stupid young people saying to me, in these days, oh hell, that's wonderful. I'll be there. I'll party with all my friends. No, you won't. You'll be more miserable, miserable and lonely than ever you imagined it was possible for a person to be. Misery in this life, friends, friends, there's comfort to be had in both life and death. But it's gotten only through faith in the Son of God. Where you can come to know that you're not your own, but you belong to a faithful Savior, Jesus. And that you can know, you have the assurance that he has made satisfaction for your sins. And you can know that you have eternal life in his name. But without that faith, without faith in his name, there is no comfort, not at all, for you. And bad and bad as things might be just now, it will only get worse. It is appointed unto man once to die. That's not the end. After that comes the judgment. Your worst nightmare will only, only just have been begun. So I bid you to go to Jesus, the only one who can give you comfort in life and death, the only one who can give you that assurance. You must needs hear his voice, not mine. My sheep hear my voice, and I give. Give, 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 because he's a giving God. Giving, always giving, abundantly giving. Giving, my sheep hear my voice, and I give unto them eternal life. He gives the faith, he gives the repentance, he gives everything. It's not of you, it's not of man, it's not of me. You can no more believe by yourself that you can pull yourself up by your bootlaces. He must give it, but you must go to him. You must go to him and you must implore him. You must get on your knees, go home and shut your door, nail it shut if you have to, and get on your knees and cry out to him. Give me eternal life. Give me the faith. Give me to believe. Give me, give me, give me. Have mercy upon me, a sinner. Give me that comfort in life and death. Ask and it shall be given. Seek and he shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened unto you. My faithful Savior says, will you not go to him? Will you not have comfort in life and death? Or will you go through the misery? Will you face the end? Will you face the torments of everlasting darkness and hell? Rather than believe, rather than submit, rather than humble yourself, rather, rather than admit that you, you're wrong and God's right. Oh, the pride, the pride of, of humanity. It's a stench in the nostrils of God and what keeps you from God and being reconciled to him and from having comfort in life and death. Only through my Savior, only through Jesus, I commend him to you. He's a wonderful, glorious Savior. He is altogether lovely. He's the fairest of 10,000. He's the lily of the valley. He's the rose of Sharon. He's wonderful. He's a gracious savior. He's kind and merciful. Oh, go to him. Repent, madam, and believe the gospel. Today, 
If you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. Believe, believe, believe. Only believe, says Jesus. If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. Only believe, trust. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ is the call of God to you today. God commands all men to believe, commands all men to repent and to believe the gospel, the words of the Savior. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Why? Because the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel, Stafford. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Repent ye and believe the gospel. For the kingdom of God is at hand. In like a copy of God's work, check these things out for yourself. See that they are so in accordance with the word of God offered freely to you, yours for the taking. You'd like one? Do feel free to come and ask for one. Gladly place it into your hand. May God bless you and have mercy upon your precious, precious, never-dying souls.